Now I understand this game. He fought both Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. The recently retired, undefeated world heavyweight champion, light heavyweight champion, Bob Foster. Heavyweight Championship, elimination bout, over 12 rounds, boxer versus fighter. In the red corner, 35 years of age, 39 wins, including 23 by knockout, in 51 fights. At 6 feet 1, and a reach of 76 inches, a weight of 203 quarter pounds, a former WBA heavyweight champion, Jimmy Ellis. In the blue corner, at 31 years of age, 31 victories, including 26 knockouts, in 33 fights. At 5 feet, 11 and a half, reach of 73 and a half inches, and a weight of 211 pounds. An Olympic gold medalist, and a world heavyweight champion, Joe Frazier. Now we're waiting for referees and struggles. My name is Ron Casey, I'm at ringside for the commentary. With me is the former great Australian welterweight champion, Tommy Burns. Welcome, Tommy. Thank you, Ron. I'm happy to be here. This is uh, the moment when the referee tells the fighters just what they can and cannot do. But for American viewers, the important uh, bit of information to come out of this is that the three knockdown rule will not automatically result in a knockout win to the fighter scoring the knockdowns. The referee is the only man who can stop the fight. The count will continue after the bell, except in the last round. And two judges and the referee are scoring it on the five-point must system. They are using eight-ounce gloves, and it's going to be a no disqualification bout. They're underway in the red trunks. Jimmy Ellis in the white shorts, smoking Joe Frazier. Frazier has not been impressive in the gymnasium. He's been a bit sluggish and a bit slow. On the other hand, Australian boxing experts have been impressed by the speed of Jimmy Ellis. Ellis, although a four to one outsider, has got a box at the first four or five rounds and stay out of the uh, way of trouble. He still will remember the 1970 knockout in five rounds that he suffered at the hands of Smoke and Joe when they fought for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. It's a matter of what the five years in between has done to the two fighters. One minute gone of the opening round. Snappy lefts from Jimmy Ellis. It's the left hook of Joe Frazier that's the big danger punch, but it was the sneaky right hand that Ellis has a reputation for that scored then. Back again with another right is Ellis. In the Jerry Quarry fight some eight months ago, Frazier showed that he's developed a great right hand too. Not that he didn't have it all the time, he just decided to show it. Ellis at 35 years of age is uh, relying on speed and his sneak right hand. His recent record has been far from impressive. He has lost four fights, had one win and one draw in his last six fights. Terry Frazier, on the other hand, had that tremendous Return fight with Muhammad Ali that he lost on points and then in June of last year came out and KO Jerry Quarry in five rounds in an impressive performance.
by American standards. Frazier is not earning a colossal... Oh, great right hand by Ellis. Frazier is not earning a colossal sum for this fight, but it's the biggest amount of money ever been paid to a fighter in Australia. $250,000 for this fight for Frazier and $75,000 payment to Jimmy Ellis. Here's Tommy Burns. The question is, uh, is Fraser rusty? He's uh, a little bit slow with sparring partners and uh, the sparring partners in training in the last week didn't have too much trouble hitting Smoking Joe. Only two fights last year and uh, there's a little bit of worry that after an eight-month layoff that Frazier could be a bit slow coming in against uh, Jimmy Ellis. Round two coming up now and uh, the bell's going and away we go for round two. Ellis has got to keep those wide open spaces. He can't afford to be uh, either pinned back on the ropes by Smoke and Joe or taken into a corner. Once he's in that corner, he's got to get out of it as quickly as he can because the walk-up, bullying, bustling tactics of Frazier will cause him trouble immediately. Oh, good left hook, and uh, that made uh, Jimmy Ellis blink. A uh, nice left hook there by Joe Frazier. And he slipped it through Ellis's guard with what appeared to be ease. Frazier following around the ring, a wild swing, but in came Frazier with a right hand at the end of the flurry. 90 seconds to go in the second round. Left and a right to the head by Jimmy Ellis. Neither fighter really scoring much advantage in this uh, third round. Fighting in close all the time. Uh, Joe Frazier trying to work away at the body. And in uh, as, the, as the fight progresses, uh, Bob Foster was warning Jimmy Ellis not to hold on quite so much. And there's the bell to end round three. It wasn't a good round. It was a quiet round. It was a round in which Frazier was working away to the body. And at times to try and nullify that body attack, Jimmy Ellis. The veteran, 35 years of age, back in 1970, the World Boxing Association version of heavyweight champion of the world, was hanging on to try and uh, uh, nullify Smoke and Joe Frazier's body attack. Tommy Burns. Two, uh, two rounds, the crowd seems to be getting a little bit restless. Uh, apparently these boys are expecting, uh, expecting this fight to go some distance. They haven't uh, are taking any risks. They're uh, fighting virtually easy compared to the other fights that we've seen on this program. 
Um, possibly they will cut loose shortly and we'll get a little bit of fireworks, but uh, they certainly have a lot of respect for each other. The dominating figure casting a long shadow after this afternoon's fight is, of course, Muhammad Ali. Both fighters want to earn the right to return with him, but, of course, Frazier is the one who would automatically step into line uh, amongst the top contenders. Rip to the body and then a right to the chin. And that was the start of this round as both fighters met in centre ring and decided to turn on some action in this fourth round. A slight nick under the left eye of Jimmy Ellis. The first sign of eye trouble to either fighter. Ellis pounding forward all the time, looking for the gap in Jimmy Ellis's uh, armor. A wild swing from Fraser. In the corner, Fraser needs to get out of here or he's going to be in trouble. I mean, Ellis needs to get out of there, moves into centre ring with the open space, and Joe seemed to just let him out of it. He had him pinned in there. Jimmy Ellis contempt to try and spear out a straight left to hold on. The ever walking forward, uh, Joe Fraser. Frazier is uh, getting a little angry because Jimmy Ellis is holding on. He's had another caution from Bob Foster. Ellis is, I think, being told to stop holding and get on with the fight. Oh, nice left hook. A little bit high on Joe Frazier's jaw, but a great punch. And a right hand from the man who has the sneak right hand, Jimmy Ellis. Another straight left from Ellis. Frazier coming forward as though the blows have not affected him. Best combination of punches yet by Jimmy Ellis. Jimmy Ellis getting the score. Although he's looking just a fraction tired. Reminiscent of the fight these two had for the vacant title back in 1970. Left hook and then a left grip to the body by Joe Frazier as the hook came from Ellis. One two from Ellis. And Ellis is certainly having no trouble landing punches on Joe Frazier. This is the Joe Frazier, Jimmy Ellis, heavyweight fight coming to you from Melbourne, Australia. A left and a right by Jimmy Ellis. And suddenly the underdog has come into this fight. That's the end of the fourth round. The the fourth round coming up on the replay. Here's our replay. Replay at the end of the fourth round when Jimmy Ellis came alive and staggered Joe Frazier. Jimmy Ellis coming up with some great punches and the last two minutes of that round were certainly all Jimmy Ellis. He looked tremendous and he was placing his punches to Frazier's head and really scoring points all the way. Ellis looked great and we're waiting for the replay to come up now. Watch it. Here's Ellis. Starts off with a right. Frazier comes back, misses with his right and there's the looping left hook. It just grazed Joe Frazier's chin. And now, as they dance away, the bell is about to ring. All the good punches came from Jimmy Ellis at the close of the fourth round. And now we're going into the fifth. And the crowd are sensing that the underdog might last a lot longer than the experts predicted he would with Smoke and Joe. Of course, those punches could well have stung Smoke and Joe Frazier into a lot of action. And he could be going out to seek a bit of revenge in this fifth round.
right uppercut by Jimmy Ellis. Apologies, this is the fourth round. The action was so hectic at the end of the third there that uh, I skipped a round forward. My apologies. We're in the fourth round. Minute and a half to go in the fourth. Oh, raise and left hook there, and Jimmy Ellis could have been in trouble if he had uh, been on the receiving end. It was just a fraction away from catastrophe. Trying to tie Joe up now. Joe's putting his head on the shoulder there and waiting for Bob Foster to break them up. It's a minute to go in the fourth round. left hook. That one hurt, Ellis. 30 seconds to go, and that's a punch that we should have a look at again. That was a big one, and that hurt, Ellis. Ellis is looking a little bit wobbly after that one. Ellis taking risks in the last second. There's another hook for that with a little bit low, landed on the neck. Ellis trying for the short right. And there's the bell to end round four. And uh, let's see that tremendous left hook. A great left hook that uh, certainly shook up Jimmy Ellis. Well on replay now. And here's Smoke and Joe in the white shorts on the right-hand side of your screen. He's looking for the opportunity. Watch the left hand. And there it is. It's a wackaroo. And it's a great punch. And that was just towards the end of the round. And Jimmy Ellis saw stars. And uh, if you'd like to have a look at that again, you'll see just what a tremendous effect it had upon Jimmy Ellis. Smoke and Joe landing his favourite punch towards the end of the fourth round. And here it is. It really goes hard when it lands home. He misses with a right and a left over the top, but swings back to an open jaw and catches Jimmy Ellis flush on the chin. There it is on the replay. We're now waiting for the bell to go to come up for the fifth round. And the signs are starting to show that Jimmy Ellis could be running into trouble with Smoke and Joe Frazier here in the big showdown match at St Kilda. Going into round five. Jimmy Ellis tries for the big left to uh, slow Smoke and Joe down, but Joe is just starting to move into top six. <laughs> Big left hook again. It's another one that's going to, as it did the time these two men fought before, smell, spell a lot of trouble for Jimmy Ellis. His trouble in the first title fight between uh, Frazier and Muhammad Ali when it knocked Ali down, and that was the punch that did it. A tremendous looping left hook. That was back in March 1971. It doesn't seem that long ago. Here it is again, another left hook in close. Crazy working away like a man intent on putting his man either to the ropes or tying him into a corner. Ellis desperately trying to tie his man up, and Crazy has no trouble wrestling him away, and for that gets a caution from Bob Foster. just bounced off uh, Jimmy Ellis's chin, that sweeping left hook. It wasn't a damaging blow and it certainly didn't uh, hurt Ellis because I was watching his eyes and they didn't blink. It was a, a punch that just breezed past his chin. Jimmy Ellis has 
seconds and supporters in the crowd, some of them who have uh, backed him at four to one, are telling him to move around, try and get away from these left hooks that in the last two rounds have been causing him so much trouble and look like turning the fight Joe Frazier's way. But Jimmy does look to be tired with one minute to go in the fifth round. seconds to go in the fifth round. Smoke and Joe. The line in his gymnasium form seems to be in perfect physical condition, walking forward all the time, taking the fight to Ellis, tiring his opponent out, and Ellis, with five seconds to go, does look a tired man as we come for the belt at the end of the fifth. Tommy Burns, the punch that did not apparent so much in that fifth round, but certainly was a dominant factor in the third and the fourth round. The left hook from Smoke and Joe Frazier, whose who's who's corner we are in right now, uh, what's the answer? What can uh, Jimmy Ellis, slightly tired, what can he do to keep out of trouble? Unfortunately, Ellis can't do very little with it. The left hook you cannot detect from the angle it is thrown, so he doesn't know it's even coming. When this course it seems to be... Uh, Joe Frazier's favourite punch, he moves in close and this is where a left hook is thrown from. And Ellis can't detect this and he, I think by the way uh, Joe is now handling him that he'll go on uh, unless of course he's got a man in his corner, Angelo what, Dundee, who could uh, could rectify this. What uh, can we'll he do? See. Can he move to the left or to the right? To the number well, he must move back. The, the moment Frazier moves to him, he's got to move away from him, move backwards and jab with the left hand. Keep out of the distance of the left hook as it's thrown in a hook fashion, of course. That's where it's derived his name from. We've been talking to Tommy Burns, one of the great welterweight fighters that Australia has produced. And we are now going into the sixth round of the showdown at St Kilda between Joe three, Frazier three. and Jimmy Ellis. It's five o'clock in the afternoon here in Australia and the sun is starting to sink lower into the west and uh, it's certainly once the fighters get to the uh, southern side of the ring or to the far side of the ring, I should say, is uh, a factor that could uh, affect their view of punches coming their way. Straight left. Two minutes to go in. The six seems to be the plan of uh, defence by Jimmy L. Uh, doesn't seem to have much in his kit to be able to slow down Smoking Joe as, as Joe keeps charging forward without any diminishing energy. Five and four, the two do anything he likes. He's not doing anything at all to get away from uh, from the uh, the area in which Frazier can hit him. He must move away faster. He doesn't seem to be moving very slowly, actually. Frazier is shuffling forward and he's getting close within range to strike these punches and Ellis doesn't seem to be doing anything about it to nullify uh, uh, Frazier at all and this has got me confused because I certainly wouldn't like to be standing there and let, allowing Frazier to connect with his punches when it seems to me that you could with a little bit of effort and not much effort that you could get away from these punches and jab this boy Ellis has a long left jab why doesn't he use it more often and box around Joe this is, this is Frazier's pattern of fighting. He gets in there, he punches away with both hands, then he comes over the top of the left hook and a right hand up. Oh, and right hand, left hook, hand left hook by Frazier. Stinging punches, punches that we'll go back and see in this sixth round of the big heavyweight fight here in Melbourne, Australia.
and they're damaging punches, those punches that come from the right side. And he's hooking with his right as well as his left razor right now, and this uh, Ellis is staying much too close to him. 20 seconds to the end, 10 seconds to the end of this round. Don't forget, viewers, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a knockdown in the final seconds of a round, the, continue, the count continues after the bell goes, except in the last round. And, of course, the three-knockdown rule has been suspended. We're going to see a video disc replay of the, the uh, punches. Here it is coming up on replay now. It's Smoking Joe in the white shorts on the right. Jimmy Ellis, tired and uh, certainly not fighting the fight to keep out of trouble. There's a left hook, and what a crashing punch it was with 30 seconds to go in the round. And that one had uh, Jimmy Ellis bouncing away as the video disc replay shows us that Ellis was certainly stung by that punch. His eyes glazed for a moment. I was watching them closely, and uh, these left hooks he has no answer for. And uh, you can see this is the classic way that uh, Joe Frazier is getting through Jimmy's defence. He's dropped that right hand slightly and whack, over it goes. There's the full momentum of the punch and that's the blow that's really hurting Jimmy Ellis in this fight. There's the bell and we come out now for the seventh round in the showdown at St Kilda. holding Frazier's arms after jabbing. <laughs> Two minutes to go in this seventh round. And Boxing fans all over the world, when I refer to St Kilda, may be wondering. It's uh, a very strong sporting centre in the uh, large southern city in Australia of Melbourne. And uh, right now in Melbourne, the right eye of Jimmy Ellis has been opened up and Bob Buster is having a look at it. He's telling the box on. Joe Frazier went back to his corner. Blood is coming down the left cheekbone, the right cheekbone rather, of uh, Jimmy Ellis. And this is a dramatic turn in the fight. A cut eye could uh, well cause Ellis a lot of trouble. right eyebrow of Jimmy Ellis has been opened up. Joe Frazier sensing an end to this fight. Frazier pressing home the obvious advantage. Ellis tired in trouble with a cut eye. Hasn't got the punch to slow Frazier down. He's in a lot of trouble here in Northern Australia. 30 seconds to go in this seventh round. By far the most important round in the fight yet. Left and right now, but they carried very little sting. The last punch of left was taken partially on the glove by Frazier. Frazier looking great. That's Angelo's famous back that we're looking at now. And we're trying to get in close enough to see how badly cut that eye is. Jimmy Ellis, certainly in a lot of trouble as we're coming out now for the eighth round. A cut eye. He hasn't got the punch to slow Frazier down. 
and he seems to be running out of uh, stamina to be able to stay in this fight. Tommy Bird. Seems that way, Ryan. Uh, Frazier is, uh, looks a certain winner in the next two rounds, I would say. Uh, Ellis just hasn't got the equipment to hold him off and keep him at bay. Well, ringsiders might be thinking right now that that eye is quite okay, but when you get an expert working on an eye in the corner, he can close up a flow of blood very quickly. But just another tap from Joe Frazier on that right eye will open it up again, and it's in a dangerous position. Jimmy Ellis starting to really slip out of this fight. He's losing the grass bottom, but he may have had, say, in the fifth or sixth round. Frazier maintaining the pressure of the pace and the stamina that he opened up with. A man in superb physical condition. Right eyebrow of Ellis, it's obvious that uh, Joe Frazier's left hook have been the punches that have been doing the damage that have opened up the eyebrow. Straight left and bounce back with the head of Jimmy Ellis. Two minutes to go in the eighth round. five-round winner in uh, New York. <laughs> Minute to go in this round. Time's important to Jimmy Ellis. Left hook in close. <laughs> Left hook just a little bit below the eye. Some crazy Ellis. Ellis so tired that he looks as though he could just as soon say, well, I've had enough of this. He's taken a lot of punishment. Frazier working away with taps to the body and then swinging up a worthwhile punch to the head. Frazier feels he has this fight well in control. Left of the head, both of them must have hurt. Uh, now let's go back and have a look at that tremendous right hand by Joe Frazier. Here it is rolling on our replay. This is the eighth round. Frazier rips away with the left of the body. Jimmy Ellis badly hurt. Tries to straighten up. There's a crashing left hook. And here's the right hand. And that was the left hook was a good punch. It was the right hand that you can see spinning Jimmy Ellis across the ring. Let's have a look at it again. And uh, you can see just how devastating that final right hand was. The left was a good one, but watch the right as well. Here it is on replay from Melbourne, Australia. Let's try and freeze it as the final the right hand punch lands. There it is. It's just about to land. If it rolls forward a fraction, you'll see it land on Jimmy Ellis's chin. Just a little bit forward it goes on our replay, and bang, bang goes the head of Jimmy Ellis and he was certainly rocked by that punch. We're coming out now for the ninth round. This is the round that some experts here in Australia using a crystal ball thought the fight might end. It's been all Joe Frazier for about the last five or six rounds, and Ellis is looking very, very tired in this night. Left hook again. A punch of the fight, as it always is with Smoke and Joe. Left Thank <laughs> you. 
do far back around the air, didn't really get it, but that left hook staggered. Well, as Ellis has caused the left and the right, his back is on the ropes. And Angelo Dundee has stopped the fight. Angelo Dundee signaled that he's had enough and the fight is all over. And the fight's all over. A weak left hand from Jimmy Ellis. And there wasn't a punch slam that really did Ellis. After 59 that much and a half off, seconds but it was stopped round. because Mugging the Joe. manager of Jimmy Ellis, Angelo Dundee, singled from the corner that his fighter had had enough. The official announcement from the ring, Tony Charles. So what now? Well, go back and rest a little bit right now. I would like to give thanks to the people here in Australia for coming out. And I hope to come back soon to visit and do some more fighting. Does that Thank imply you. that you are likely to fight Muhammad Ali in uh, Melbourne? Whoever has decided to pick, take on, we will fight them guys. Is there a real prospect of a further match between you and Muhammad Ali? Well, I would say yeah, he got no place to go. He's been ducking and dodging me for a long time. And would you be good enough to summarize this fight as you saw it? I would say Jimmy fought a real smart fight. He hang on as long as he can. He, he boxed, he moved, and he tied me up. I would say that was very smart. I couldn't get away from him at first, so I got myself together. Thank you, Joe. Thank you anyway in Australia. Thank you. And we'll call on Angelo Dundee, the trainer of Muhammad Ali. Does that mean your boy is finished as a heavyweight contender now, Angelo? Well, uh, you never like to put the death knoll before it's over. I mean, Jimmy fought a good fight. Joe was good. And I think the, I asked the referee to stop it when Jimmy couldn't throw any punches. Joe was too good. It was yeah. his night tonight. Yeah, that intimidating, if not murderous, left hook really started to work again. Beautiful left hook. Did a good job. Best man won tonight. Smoke and Joe is leaving the ring. Can I ask you, as Muhammad Ali's trainer, what prospect we have in Australia of seeing Muhammad Ali fight? Well, when I go back to uh, Deer Lake training camp and tell Muhammad how nice you people are here. I think it'll be very interesting. <laughs> and would you care to forecast a fight between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier? Well, I don't know. I think that Muhammad will beat Joe Frazier every day in the week, twice on Sunday. Angelo Dundee. Jimmy Ellis lost the fight. Jimmy, what did you think about it? Elimination well, I felt good early, and, uh, Smoking I Joe couldn't Frazier. catch him like I wanted to at the end. My manager kept telling me to suck him with the right hand, but I just couldn't catch him. I tried to hit him with a left hook. I tried to catch him with a right hand, but uh, the guy was uh, bobbing and weaving, and I just couldn't pick him up where I wanted. You didn't seem to be able to handle that left hook. It was the one, well, as in the previous yeah. fight, that brought you undone. Well, Frazier got a good left hook, and uh, no matter what nobody said, the guy got a powerful left hook. He caught me with a good left hook, but I was trying to get up on it and try to hit him with a good, sticky right hand, but I just couldn't get it off. Well, it was a great fight, and, uh, well, from Melbourne, Australia, we've enjoyed it. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, Ellis. thank you very thank much. Thank you. Well, uh, that is uh, just about the end of our telecast here from Melbourne, Australia. On behalf of uh, well, everyone concerned with this telecast to the United States and throughout Australia, uh, I'd like to thank the promoters and also Joe Frazier and Jimmy Ellis for coming all this way to Melbourne to give Australia its first major heavyweight title fight, not title fight, major fight since Jack Johnson fought Tommy Burns way back in 1908. This is Ron Casey signing off from the St Kilda junction ground in Melbourne, Australia and saying good afternoon Australia, America and all boxing nations of the world on behalf of Tommy Burns and myself. Good afternoon. The lineup of fights has been simply terrific. Not only what we have seen already in these two short weeks but also what is coming up in the future. Tonight Mick, you've got one of the big boys in here. We have the biggest biggest fellows in the business tonight. The number the number two guy in the world, you're looking at him now, that's George Foreman from Oakland, California. He boasts of 34 knockouts in his brief career as a professional, former uh, gold medal winner and Olympic heavyweight champion. 
a fine prospect. Many feel that he'll be, be, become the next uh, heavyweight champion of the world. Well, certainly, George Foreman is one of the men who is most anxious to get a shot at that heavyweight title, and his record will, without question, one day lead him right there, because there's no question about it. If you're a heavyweight, if you're high-ranked as he is, you most certainly have got to be afforded that opportunity. Ted Gulick, his opponent tonight in the corner. Mickey, how about a little background on Ted? Well, Teddy Gulick also boasts of a fine knockout record. He won his first 13 fights as a professional by knockouts. He What's his best punch? His best punch uh, is a left hook. However, he's a very good right-hand puncher. He hails from Cleveland, Ohio. He was a former uh, Golden Glove champion before entering the pro ranks. Well, I don't know about all the rest of you boxing fans, but I remember some great fighters coming out of that Cleveland area, and if Ted Gulick is any part of that particular tradition, he ought to give George Foreman some kind of a busy evening tonight. Well, we'll be right back with all the action in this heavyweight encounter for you after we take this time out for this message. Why the city of Los Angeles is the boxing capital. The folks are here to see great boxing, and that's exactly what they're going to see. All right, let's go up to Stan Brown. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. We have here tonight from Mexico, fine bantamweight, Ameo Anaya. We have the number five bantamweight in the world out of Mexico, Formoso Gomez. And the hardest hitting bantamweight from Mexico, Julio Guerrero. The former featherweight champion of the world, now fighting as a lightweight out of Mexico, Sugar Ramos. Let's hear it for that big heavyweight, Roby Harris. Ladies and gentlemen, the former welterweight champion in the state of California, Irish Gil King. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the current heavyweight champion from Argentina, Eduardo Corletti. Ladies and gentlemen, the number two light heavyweight in the world, undefeated in 35 professional fights, Irish Mike Quarry. And we have here tonight in the ring, the number two heavyweight contender in the world, Irish Jerry Quarry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Forum Boxing Incorporated, in association with George Parnassus, Don Frazier, Director of Boxing, presents tonight's program, which is under the supervision of the California State Athletic Commission. Your physician at ringside is Dr. Jack Useem, your timekeeper and counting at the knockdowns, Cliff Gauze. Dick Young will be your referee for the main event, judges at ringside, Larry Rosadilla, Eddie Fierro, your ringside TV commentators, Tom Harmon, and matchmaker, Mickey Davy. We're ready to go now with our main event here tonight, featuring heavyweights, scheduled to go 10 rounds. On my right, in black trunks, from Cleveland, Ohio, weighing 194 pounds, the hard-punching Ted Gulick. And on my left in red trunks, from Hayward, California, leading heavyweight contender in the world, undefeated in 34 fights, 31 wins by knockout, weighing 221 and a half pounds, George Foreman. Your referee, Dick Young. Where's his mouthpiece? All right, let's see your mouthpiece, George. George, your mouthpiece. Hey, where's your mouthpiece? 
I'll get it. I'll get it. Oh, I'll get all it. right, get it. All right, now, fellas, you're going 10 rounds in here. You know the rules. You know what's permitted and what isn't. I want you to fight accordingly. Now, you keep your punches up when you go for the body. Don't hold with one hand and hit with the free hand. I'll give you the opportunity to fight out of every clinch. But whatever you're doing when I say break, you both stop it and you step back cleanly. Protect yourselves when you do. Now, the event of a knockdown, the man down must take eight. Okay? You can use Vaseline, but go light on it. All right, shake hands. Good luck to both of you. Let's go. All right, the big boys, George Foreman in the red trunks, Ted Gulick in the black. Both the big men, a lot of power, a lot of punching, and anything can happen with one shot. Foreman a stand-up, straightaway heavyweight, keeping those hands out in front of him. 220 pounds, you know the power is there. Gulick, not very much behind him. 215. Foreman using a very stiff left jab and crossing it. Combining it with an uppercut. Stiff left jabbing, a big right cross by Gulick that time. Foreman using his hands out in front of him defensively, and Gulick connects with a big right cross. Foreman shooting that left jab out there, and that hits like a piston. Wow. Will again with a good left and right combination. None of the punches so far, although they've had a lot of power, seem to be affecting either fighter. Which must be a good indication that they're both in fine shape. However, when you get with the big guys like this, it only takes one in the right spot. Left hook by Gilly. Foreman's style is unusual, Mickey. We'll get into that when we get a little bit more time. The second's running out here in round one. George Foreman in the red trunks coming out of his corner. Ted Gulick in the black trunks, his opponent tonight. These are the big boys, the heavyweights. Foreman's style, Mickey, of carrying his hands out in front of him like that seemed to be a very good defense for him. He catches a lot of punches on those forearms. I noticed the referee, Dick Young, going to the corner of Foreman between rounds to warning him about one thing or the other, possibly the fact that he could have been punching with an open glove. I will have no way of really knowing. Foreman so far has been using that left jab. Gillick has been trying to hook him, caught him a couple of times. Not any of the really big ones. Foreman really coming in with the left at that time. Gillick on the good right. Oh, 
Foreman trying to push Gulick away. Dick Young tells the boys to break. Left right combination by Foreman. The left to the jaw and the right to the heart. A slight puffiness under the left eye of Foreman. Foreman unloads a roundhouse to the kidneys. Gulick is catching those left hands on his glove, but that right caught his chin. Two left hooks. The second one was right on target. And it's all over. A 10 count on two straight left hooks. We'll have an opportunity to run that back for you in slow-mo. George Foreman, a second round knockout over Ted Gulick. And according to the unofficial time, we're at two minutes and 28 seconds into the second round. Two real good left hooks, both of which connected. Stan Brown moving around the ring now, picking up the official scorecards from the judges give them an opportunity to make it official and here is Stan with the decision ladies and gentlemen your attention please the winner on a knockout 228 into round two still undefeated George Foreman we'll be back to talk to the winner George Foreman after this word All right, let's go up to the corner now for Mickey and his conversation with George Foreman. Thank you, Tom. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the winner's circle here at the Fabulous Forum in Los Angeles, California. With us, uh, I think that's knockout number uh, 35, George? Uh, 32. 32, okay. 35 uh, fights. 35 fights, 32 knockouts, which is a pretty fair country record. Mm -hmm. George, uh, we noticed bet between the first and second round, referee Dick Young paid a trip to your corner and was saying something to you and, uh, to, as well as Dick Sadler and Johnny Smith. What was he telling you? No, he was only mentioning it to me. It was about something he don't know of, a parry and a punch, uh, being able to stop a punch before they are delivered. And he thought, you know, he was just, you know, commenting about it. I uh, making thought... Making a comment about it, and, you know, he wasn't understanding. And then he asked Dick about it, and then it was all understood, you know, understanding. I thought perhaps he was warning you about, about possibly uh, hitting with, open, with an open glove, but I guess no, that wasn't no. the case. We're looking at the action in the second round in which the fight was uh, halted in your favor by he a knockout. All the punches that I'll knock over my hand, this is what he was trying to check on. Stop the punches before they get going. This, there's there's four, four types of punches. There's parry, you slip, you roll, and you, you counter. So when you take the hands and with the hands open, you parry punches. Stop them before they go. See, he's just reaching out and touching them on the That's arm. an old Jack Johnson trick, is it not, Dick? That's right, the, yeah, on. that's what it is. An old one of them, he was famous for that, and I imagine you see George just stopping the punches out there before he starts them. Which I know Foreman wasn't around in those days, but you certainly were. Look out, Mickey, <laughs> I don't play that. <laughs> Look, now, you ain't laughed all week, and as soon as you said how old it was, George laughed. <laughs> It's a good match and the boy's game and he's Think dangerous. That was a punch that led to the knockout. I like I liked that move. You moved to the right and fired the left hook and it uh, right. landed in the body. Excellent punch. George, he nailed you with a couple of pretty fair left hooks and one, one or two the right guy, hands. Did it bother you at all? The guy has a good left hook and I think we're fighting guys with those kind of left hooks in order to prepare ourselves if we're fortunate to fight Joe Frazier for the title. 
And as you'll see, he's a little man who's doing a little Joe Frazier tactics. And I'm really trying my best to beat him, but yet I'm trying to get some little schooling. And we're both out there trying to beat each other. And we, got, we both are picking up a lot tonight. I think those body shots hurt a little too. There's no question about it. And especially that you wrapped him in the kidney with that right hand a couple I of times. That hook that led to the knockout right there. Nick Sadler, were you surprised to see uh, Teddy Gulick use that wraparound style? Something that the old mongoose Archie Moore used to do when you were handling him. Very, very, he's pretty adept at it too. Everyone tries, but uh, uh, Gullick does a pretty good job of it. He, he's elusive uh, guy and he's dangerous. You see, you see, he comes out of nowhere with a wild left hook and if you're not on your toes. So. Good left hook, that was the right hand. The right hand was a little high, a little was it long. not? Yeah, a little long. It was a little too, it was a little too far out away from it, reaching a little too. That's right. the one that done it there. Right. Yeah, second that, that second one nothing. But the first one, the second, kind of, he was hurt. Okay, now, gentlemen, we're going to take a peek at it in slow motion. George, you can It'll see. a good left hook that kind of hurts him, and then I'll follow mm. up quickly. Now, see his hands there about what you were speaking of. You can notice that, too, and see how George just reach out there and touch him. Just open his hand, just to put his hands on him and touch him. Actually, to actually, you push him off balance with the just right hand and fired the left hook. Right. See the guys. He slipped that uh, right hand and and went underneath the uh, left hook by right. Gullick. Right. That's what we try to figure and then to balance. keep him off balance as much as I'm getting set, pulling around him, dancing around him, moving around him. Mm -hmm. Good left hook. Mm -hmm. All right, Richard, another uh, knockout tonight. Uh, what do you have, uh, what does, does the future look like for well, future, George Foreman? Our immediate, our immediate future is to go up to Oakland and fight for the Special Olympics in June, on the 24th of this month in Oakland, California against the Miguel Paz, P-A-E-Z, from Buenos Aires. Yeah, he's a pretty fair uh, a pretty fair fighter from yes, the Argentine. He is, he is, and he has a technical win over Bonavina from there, and so we look to have a, a good fight, and we're hopeful that we'll be successful and continue to try and get a fight with Joe Frazier. There is the left hook, George, and once again, that's the second hook. Mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. I hear uh, Johnny Smith, the former state middleweight king, in the background speaking to George Foreman about the right hand. You know, not too many guys can uh, fire with a right hand like Johnny Smith. No, you know? Johnny Smith, his record stands for itself, and everybody well, knows. to have him in the ring with us tonight yeah. in it's the corner. It's nice to see old Lesson Gain. It's been a long time. Alongside Burns and a whole bit. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And okay. congratulations, congratulations, George, to you. Appreciate that. Richard Sadler, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And you, Johnny Smith, see you around, okay? Um, All right. Please stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen. Tom Harmon will be back with an important guest right after this. Thank you. Thank you. We're live now in Atlantic City, ready for our heavyweight bout. And yesterday we had a chance to talk with both Razor Ruddick and Kim Odom. We asked Ruddick if he may be looking past this fight. I don't think I, anyone should ever take, uh, make that mistake and look at it as a tune-up because you see what happened to Mike Tyson. Um, I take my sport very seriously and anyone walking in front of me in the ring I'm going to take it just as seriously as if I was fighting for the title. I sparred with him before, and they sent me home. They said he was hurt, so. And then they say he broke his hand, and they canceled the fight. They rescheduled it. So I don't know what's wrong with this guy, but I'm finding out what his weakness is. Like a gunslinger, you know, you're on top of the um, uh, the ladder. So they're gonna when they come, they're gonna make sure they're they're sharp enough to try and take away that um, position from you. It might be a KO. I might have to put my initials on him. Well, I'm joined live at ringside now by Gil Clancy. And uh, Gil, let's talk first about Razor Ruddock. I guess some people might wonder, well, hey, if he's ranked number three in the world, why is he taking a fight like this one? Well, Tim, you know, I always believe in keeping a fighter busy. If this is the best fight that Ruddock can get, yes, he has to take it to keep busy. Now, as far as Kimmy Olodum is concerned, not nearly as well known as Razor Ruddock. Uh, still, it's apparent that he sees this as a great opportunity. He has shed... 
20 pounds from those clips we sh uh, showed you at the top of our program today. He's down to a fighting 234 and looks good. Tim, he knows this is an opportunity for him. And he's no pushover, you know. He has a good win over an up-and-coming heavyweight, Rufus Hadley. Art Tucker went in with a 16-0 record. He knocked him out. He's had a lot of international amateur experience. He knows this is the opportunity, and he's going to go for it. Odom went 12 tough rounds against Ray Mercer in his last outing. Now, I guess the question about Ruddock today is that he has come in at 240 pounds. That's 10 pounds higher than he ever has before, and yet he says he's in shape. Tim, as a former trainer, I don't like that a bit. Tim, I just don't like that a bit. You know, if the fight goes any distance, those 10 pounds could prove an anchor later in the fight. All right, well, we'll be back with Razor Ruddock, ranked number three in the world, and Kimmy Willodum after these words from your local station. From the beautiful Broadway Mile Bay Theater here at Harris Atlantic City, New Jersey, the better people in the boxing capital of the world, as Murad Muhammad, in association with Harris, presents this afternoon's main event and is approved by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board, the Honorable Larry Hazard Senior Commissioner. And remembering at this time, the man in charge of the scheduled 10-round heavyweight bout, referee Rudy Meadow. Now, my good friends, introducing the principals. First, in the red corner, wearing the black trunks with the golden red frame. He weighed in at even 234 pounds. This gentleman has 13 We're back live at Harris Atlantic pounds. City. The From fighters Harry are being Indiana. introduced. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Razor Ruddock. Coming in at 240 pounds. And Odom. Odom. And his opponent in the blue corner. And Odom at 234. He is 30 years of age. Razor Reddick just 24 years of age and considered by many as the most dangerous fighter in the heavyweight division. Awaiting his opportunity as they sort things out at the top there with Douglas Tyson. Holyfield and George Foreman working his way in. Two tall, big heavyweights. In New Jersey, the three knockdown roll means three knockdowns in a round would end the fight. There is a standing eight count in New Jersey, meaning uh, in effect it is like a knockdown if the referee uh, judges that the fighter is in trouble. He can give him a standing eight count even though he hasn't gone to the canvas. The doctor can stop a fight here in New Jersey. Rudy Battle is the referee giving the boxers their final instructions. And you're looking at Kim Odom. And here is Razor Ruddock from Weston, Ontario, a suburb just outside of Toronto. Born in Jamaica, moved to Toronto at the age of 11. An accomplished tennis player as a youngster and still plays that game very well indeed. Ranked number three in the world, 23-1-1. Kim Odom, 12-3 with one no contest. 11 knockouts in his 12 victories. And a guy who has really taken this opportunity to its full, knocking off about 20 pounds down to 234, because he knows that uh, if he can beat the number three man in the world, that'll move him into the top 10. Well, Tim, he knocked off the uh, 20 pounds, and Razor Ruddock put on 10 pounds, so uh, that could be a little bit of an equalizer. Ruddock has been very confident, very relaxed before this fight. This fight scheduled originally for the 1st of July, and Ruddock had suffered a broken bone in his right wrist, the ulna bone, and uh, it was uh, just simply not in top form for the July 1st date, so the fight was postponed. He now says that everything is just fine and it's fully healed, not been bothered with it in training. But Tim, you know, uh, Razor Ruddock relies on that good stiff left jab, but Odom has that sneak right hand that he throws over a jab once in a while, but he has to go for it, he has to let it go. Judges for the fight are William Costa from Trenton, John Riley from Mountainside, New Jersey, John Condon from Blackwood, New Jersey. Get off his head. Great guy, please. Get off his head. Most boxing observers don't expect uh, their services will be needed. Round one, scheduled for 10. Odelman Black, Laser Ruddock, and White. Combination is won by Odelman. And no reply from Razor Ruddock. Now Ruddock riding Odom back, lands a right hand 
coming down the pipe. And the left hook behind it to the ear. A big right to the ear and the left. He's got Odom in some trouble here. But Odom fires back. One thing about Ruddick, he has power in both hands. Makes no difference which one he hits you with. Ruddick's last outing, an impressive four-round stoppage of Michael Dokes in April of this year. Odom's last fight, 12-round decision loss at the hands of Olympic champion Ray Mercer. With a big left hook by Ruddick and a right hand behind him. Ruddick had to go in the first round. No thing when you throw those big bombs, sometimes you leave yourself wide open. I'd like to see Razor Ruddick using that jab a lot more and set this guy up before he throws those bombs. Ruddick with victories over Dokes, Mike Weaver, James Broad, Bone Crusher Smith. None of those guys in the prime at the time that he beat them. But nonetheless, he has looked more impressive when he's shouting. Now ranked number three in the world by all three boxing organizations. Second remaining in the first round. Coming to the end of round number one of the scheduled 10 round heavyweight bout. Great stuff out. Get off his neck. Get off. Run. How about a nice round of applause? How do you like me? Marco. George, can I hear you on interrupt, please? Okay, I just wanted to set a level with you. That's good. Thank you. No, I'm fine. Number two, live from Atlantic City, Tim Ryan and Gil Clancy watching heavyweights. Donovan Razor Ruddick in white. Left hook to open the second round against Kimuel Odom. Odom from Gary, Indiana. Macon-born Ruddick from Western Ontario near Toronto. Wife Judith and three children back home in Canada. From this single, living with his family in Gary. 30 years of age, full day. Which short left hook? Good combination behind it. Odom holds a disqualification victory over Mike Tyson when they were amateurs. Back in 1984. Get off his neck. Made it to the Olympic trials quarterfinals. Three times Chicago Gold Gloves champion. A lot of amateur experience, but a late starting pro. Just 16 pro bout to his credit. One qualifier. heard Odom uh, claim that he was sparring with Ruddick and they sent him home because in his judgment he was hurting Ruddick. Now, there was that right hand that Odom threw. Took a chance that time and just missed with it. And I'd still like to see Razor Ruddick using that snappy left jab a lot more than he's using. He's looking to load up on every punch. This round two, schedule 10. <laughs> Uh, Razor Ruddick say he couldn't hit this guy lightly. Uh, look what happened to Mike Tyson. So presumably uh, he will not do so. Uh, oh, he's got a live guy in front of him. And Odom is a stubborn guy, Tim. I remember in this fight with Art Tucker. I mean, he got hit some good solid shots, but he just doesn't give up. Keeps in there, keeps popping away. And sure enough, uh, Tucker got a little tired and got him out of there. For a minute to go. A big left hand landed by Ruddick. That fight to fight Odom. Odom. It did indeed. Again, Tim, he's wide open when he's walking in. Keep that form, keep that snapping jab out there. That cost him in his fight against Bone Crusher Smith, who knocked him down. Put off the canvas to stop him. Smith. Let him up. Great, step out. You know, he devastated uh, Michael Douglas with two left hooks. Tim, sometimes that stays in their mind and they forget their boxing plan. 
Looking to get the guy out with every punch. Under 30 seconds we go here in the second round. <laughs> Wound up with that right hand. Two rights landed by Owen. Another right hand landed by Owen. Final seconds of the second round. We need to know how many points are taken away. Dan? Dan? Find out from Hazard how many points he took away. The referee took some points away. Larry's over here. Don't try to get even now. Anybody hits after the foul, you're going to lose. Well, Odom rallied well at the end of round two. Now watch what happens here after the bell. Razor Ruddock knocked Odom down with a left hand, and Rudy Battle has deducted some points. It is a one-point penalty as we hit into round three. Let's see if that arouses Odom. So Razor Ruddock, after the bell, unloaded a left hand on Odom, and it has cost him a point. And sometimes it's better to lose a point. I mean, what kind of condition is Odom in to get hit with that left hook with his hands down? Well, and Odom had done a good job in the final seconds of landing several combinations to the head of Razor Ruddock. And then suddenly after the bell, he found himself on the seat of his pants. He's evidently all right. Well, he's never been stopped, that thing. One of those stubborn guys stays in there. And again, with that extra 10 pounds that the Ruddick's standing around, he knows what's going to happen if the fight goes in his And meanwhile, Odom has got some of the crowd on his side here as a result of the unsportsmanlike shot by Ruddick. Now, Ruddick, three left hooks, one of them locking Odom back into the ropes. Well, he certainly has the crowd on his side now, Tim. They're chanting Odom, Odom. Well, the underdog, Timuel Odom. There's a big left hook that rocks Odom and sends him back to the ropes again. Right, up his pace here in round three. Let's find out from the Odom corner what they uh, thought of the foul by Razor Reddick. Uh, Dan Jenkins is over there, Dan. Tim, they are calling for a disqualification over in the uh, Camille Odom corner. Ralph Citro, the cut man, is screaming still. Why don't you disqualify him for that late shot? Tim, back to you. Thanks, Tim. Well, that follows on the heels of yesterday's controversial uh, win by Nigel Ben over Iran Barkley. Many thinking, uh, Gil and I included, that referee Carlos Padilla should have disqualified Nigel Ben for knocking Barkley on the uh, head after Barkley was already on the end. And Tim uh, Ruddick has thrown a lot of punches, a lot of hard punches, and he still hasn't really wobbled Tim Will Odom. Again, that, that, ten, that 10 pounds, if this fight goes any distance, puts him very, very oh, well. Oh, right hand to the left hand. It was a short right hand that did the damage. Snapping back the head of Odom and a big left behind it. Now Ruddick trying to get the crowd back on his side, but they're booing him. Is Odom going to make it up? No, it is all over. Third round knockout for Razor Ruddock. Not a popular one following his late blow at the end of round two. The Razor Ruddock has scored a knockout victory. He is 18 in 24 victories.
Stopping the second down low to in the third round. Watch for the short right hand that sets this up. There's the right to the head and then the left hand behind it. Actually, it wasn't as short as I thought. It was a real haymaker. Tim, I tell you, that, that run certainly has the punching power. No question about it. He can punch. There's the right hand and there's the left behind it. Bringing it up from underneath. And a knockout victory scored by Donovan Razor Radical, number three ranked heavyweight in the world. Well, we've got more boxing ahead on CBS Sports Sunday. We'll be talking to the winner, Razor Reddick, and we'll also bring you some action from this boxer. Who is that guy, anyway? What a way to enter the ring. Macho Man or Birdman? Well, you might have guessed it. It's Hector Macho Camacho. You'll see him in action against Tony Baldazar, a fight that took place last week. But we return on CBS Sports Sunday. We're back live in Atlantic City after a knockout victory by Razor Ruddock. Ladies and gentlemen from Harris Atlantic City, New Jersey, the time of this bout, two minutes and 58 seconds of the third round, and a winner by a knockout, Donovan Razor Ruddock. Out the winner of this fight, Razor, you got the crowd all upset at you because of that punch you threw after the bell at the end of round two. What happened there? First of all, I'd like to say hi to all the people in Jamaica. I'd like to say hi to all the people in the PA Hell Athletic League in Fort Lauderdale, and my mother and father in Canada. Um, Nathan Brown, this is for you. What happened there? Why did you throw the punch after the bell? Um, um, uh, uh, Tim. What happened was, um, I got a little bit frustrated because, first of all, all these other good fighters are ducking me. They forced me to get up for this fight. I mean, after knocking out Michael Dawes in the fourth round, I was up for that fight. And um, they gave me a guy like Tim Ulodum. And it was a lot of pressure. I got frustrated. I wanted to knock him out. I got there a little bit tight. I did not um, utilize my total ability. And he was there looking in my face, and I just got pissed and knocked him out. Well, Razor, uh, also just near the end of that round, uh, that was his best flurry, and uh, he was he, he was doing some damage to you there. He wasn't damaging me. I was play, I was laughing actually because he can't punch me. That's where I feel, and I was just taking my time trying to get into the fight. I know when I hit him, he's gonna go. All right. Well, it could have been a could, could have been a costly thing for you. It cost yeah. you a point. Nonetheless, you well, came back and finished him off in the third round with the power that uh, people are starting to expect from you. It was a big right hand over the top that really hurt him first, coming right here. And then a left behind it. Hey, I'm telling you one thing, right? I'm really sorry I hit him after the bell. I knew I was going to get him sooner or later. And I'm, I'm sorry if I make all the people upset. But it's part of boxing. We're in here. It's a brutal sport. It's not a tennis match. This is a fight. And sometimes you get upset. You know, people don't know how much it takes for you to build up to get to, to be able to fight another man and try to knock him out. All right, now, as it to... turned out, you won a third round knockout, but there was some question about you coming in 10 pounds heavier than you ever have for a fight before. Well, I think I was, um, that was, a, I think was a factor in the beginning to be able to let me start off fast. And I think it's because I was taking some amino acid, some power pack pill, energy pill I was training with. And I think that's what put on the, the 10 pounds. And All I right, so what's your optimum weight, you think? My optimum weight is probably 230 because I felt dynamite with the Michael Dokes in the um, 230 pounds. I'm going to try and keep it at 200.